Good morning. Uh, welcome to Techfield Extra at Cisco Live in Berlin. Um, it's really nice to be back here again. Um, I'm going to be talking about nBase-T. So this whole thing, we have uh, multi-gigabit and we have uh, nBase-T and 83 bz So in reality, what we're talking about is running 2.5 and, and 5G base-T over your current install base uh, category 5e and category 6 cabling. So I'm a speaker today. Um, this actually was, it was a good trip because I uh, got to go to Beijing. So this was actually with, with IEEE. I even got to go to the, build, to the wall and it was a good day. I'm a principal engineer. I report up into the campus switching side of Cisco. So this means I basically I work for the people who build Catalyst 2K, 3K, 4K, and the 6K guys as well. So for those for the data center virtualization, this can be a little bit of a stretch. Think of it as, think of it as extra credit. But I would like you to think about whether some of the things I'm saying apply to you. Um, I do system architecture. I talk about the ASICs. I talk about hardware and software. Um, I'm also, I work as part of the standardization group for this. So Adithil 3BZ, I actually started, I got that project started in, in IEEE, and I'm an ad hoc chair, and I chair the Invest here lines. So thank you for having me back, right? So clearly, Steve and Tom don't really know what they're doing, because they had me here once, and they got me back again. Um, so I was here last year with Peter, and we talked a bit. Um, have a look, right? So this is all, you can go and see what I said last year. And the basic premise for this talk was I wanted to come back and say, last year I said we've got this great idea, you know, we're going to get something started. And I want to tell you what we've got done, right? There's not much trade over, so I'm also going to go through back, back through the original material, so Peter might remember some of it already. Um, at the time last year, we had three products announced, we announced them at the show. Um, the Alliance was getting going, and standards was just starting. We had a few blogs written. So one of the things that we had was uh, Tom wrote a blog, um, David Gee wrote a blog, Probably the most interesting one was uh, Hans's blog, right? He titled that as uh, Lipstick on Your Pig. This was a fun, fun discussion. As I recall, I got a little annoyed about his, his tweet, and so I replied, I thought about it for a second, I said, so Hans, the trick is, you have to make the pig hold still while you apply the world's best lipstick. <laughs> so, it's not actually untrue, because what we're really trying to do is say, you have, a, you have a resource, and we want to get better use out of it. So, let's get going. I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of Ethernet. Because as we've gone through this process, the way Ethernet is changing, is cha the way Ethernet is changing has changed a lot. Right? We used to do a very simple thing. The rule was 10 times, 10 times the speed for 3 times the price. We're not, there, we're not there anymore. So think about Ethernet. So this is the original picture. So this is um, where Robert Metcalf first described Ethernet, right? back in 73. As you see, he's clearly got labeled in here. Oh man, the pointery things don't work. Look, the ether. Um, the the uh, standard got going in 1980, right? It's actually in February 1980, and I know that because Dave over here told me. So it's Project 802. So it's the second month of uh, 1980. Does anyone remember this one? Anyone okay. have a cable like this? Remember wiring it together? Wasn't it fun? Yeah. And yellow cable still there at some data centers? The thick yellow at the cable? Ground. <laughs> Do you remember this one? Right? Do you remember CheaperNet? Remember, CheaperNet was great because you could extend it yourself, right? And so if you didn't have enough taps in your desk, you put another couple in, which is really fine until the guy on the other end of the building suddenly didn't have any Ethernet anymore. The sound guy's laughing. I'm clearly doing well. And what I really want to talk about today a lot is Base-T, right? I'm going to make the argument that this is where Ethernet really, really took off and got going and really became mass market. So originally we were based over CS CSMACD. But we've evolved, right, over lots of years, lots of speeds, lots of media. If you want to know more about this, you should attend or review the session that Dave and I are doing. Over in the corner, I have a colleague of mine, Dave Zacks. Um, this is BRK uh, CRS 3900, and it's all about Ethernet evolution. Now, you will have seen most of the material, but we also talk a little bit about deterministic Ethernet and also about PoE. So the session is uh, recorded from um, San Diego last year, so you can go and look at it on online. Or you could come and visit us, which would be sort of nice. Either cheer or heckle. OK. I'm briefly going to put up the uh, Base-T roadmap. What's interesting about this, I really need a real pointer. So 10 Base-T back in 1990. Who was in the networking business then? All raise hands. OK. The sound guy, yes. Lauren. Then we went up to 100 Base-T, TX. I don't know if you remember, but there was a big argument at that stage. Um, whether it was 100 base T or TX or VG AnyLAN. Um, so 100 meters on CAT3, 100 meters on CAT5. Then we did 1,000 base T, right? 
1999. So the interesting thing about that was it was originally supposed to be Cat5. Then they realized it didn't quite work and so they actually had to go back to 5e and make the cable better. So 5e I think stands for 5 enhanced. So 2006, we got 10 G by C, 100 meters on Cat6A. Let me get, so 5e, we got 6, 6 is sort of in the middle somewhere, 6A is the big nice stuff. So it's sort of interesting because 2006, we're 16, that's a decade ago. Why hasn't it taken over? So what's interesting, you notice here is every one of these new guys was new cabling infrastructure. That works really, really nicely in Greenfield, right? If I'm mostly building new buildings, that's a wonderful thing. If you like someone like Amy, who's got a lot of older buildings, and I come in as a vendor and say, I've got this great new idea, here's this new speed. If you just pull a whole new cable, that actually she kicks me out. So also going on right now, we have uh, 25 GBST and 40 GBST. Those are really being done for the data center, right? And so their reaches are set to 30 meters. So they're really looking at, at uh, middle of row, end of row. So that's also 30 meters on category eight. So category eight is even bigger than the category 6A. But what I really want to talk about here is in 2016, at the same time we're doing 25 GBST and 40 GBST, we're also doing two and a half and five. And specifically the goal is to do them on Cat5 e and Cat6. Because I know that Amy doesn't want to pull new cables. Right, so here we've got the labeling of things. I showed you already. Cat5 e, you guys have seen it. Some small, nice light cable, it's nice and bendable, not much in the middle of it. Cat6, it's a bit bigger. And 6A, it's a big, heavy cable. So even if you wanted to pull it, right, you might find it's expensive, it's, it's heavier, it may not fit in your duct. So recabling, we had this discussion earlier, this is when you build a new building or you fully risk in. Other than that, this is something you want to, want to mostly avoid. Okay, so we're going for multi gigabit over Cat5 and Cat6, because I want to address that huge install base. Uh, so Peter was telling me he's a wireless guy, so he knows this off by heart. So wireless you've seen, right, we evolved originally from early 2000, it was sort of a nice thing to have. I remember when I shot up in Silicon Valley, uh, in the startups there was like no Wi-Fi. Um, and then we sort of got pervasive, and now we're mission critical, right? Most of you guys, if you're dealing with wireless, right, where are you, where are you on here? Sort of this end, like stuff just, is just expected to work on wireless? Yes, no? Anyone not have any wireless? One step back, yeah. Hmm? Well, you're Expected somewhere in here, right? Yeah, it depends on where you are. Okay. Okay, so let's look at what happened with the wireless standards. What's interesting is these guys have evolved so fast, right? So, you know, here we were at like 450 megabits. But now, we're up here, right? So we're up at 3.5 or 6.8 gig. Now, in deference to the Wi-Fi people, this is raw rates, right? You know, your mileage may vary. But these things are getting faster very rapidly. And you go, hang on a second. If this is happening here, and I'm still running 1000 base T, which is standardized in 1999, something's got to give. So, why 2 enough and 5G base T? So, between 2003 and 2014, we sold 70 billion meters of uh, Cat5 e and Cat6 cabling. 10 meters each. So we've sold more than 4 billion, um, 100,000 base T ports in the last 20 years. What's really interesting for the install base is that you get incremental upgrade. You don't have to rip everything out, right? So you're not, you're, if I put some more switches in, maybe two or three or 4% of my devices need higher speeds, maybe 15. But everything else can run at sold speed. So you don't have to rip and replace your entire network. Again, if you're, in, if you're in an infrastructure, going and saying you're gonna take everything out, not pretty. Um, so order negotiation makes this easier. You plug in base T, it talks to each other, it chooses the highest common denominator. So that's gonna make my upgrade story easier. The old, guy's AP, the old guy's PC over there still running 100 meg, works just fine with the thing running 10 GBST. Um, so existing specifications for 5 and 6 only support one gig, but we can actually do faster. So I think the way I try and think about this is, we have a huge investment in this cable, right? Now it costs the money to put in, but to replace it, depending on what you're doing, 300, 400, 500, 700 dollars a run. Now, if you're doing a new building, great, go for it, put in good cable, you never want to go back. If you want to open up an old building, a hospital, a school, that's very ugly. So we're really saying, what can I enable? If I can solve your problem here and break that bottleneck, what can you do in your network? Okay, so let's quickly look about the uh, platforms and use cases. Right? The terminology Cisco is using for this is, is multi-gigabit Ethernet. Um, we didn't actually want quite such a long term, but the really short term we had got killed by the branding folks. So Cisco multi-gigabit Ethernet. I'm going to look at some platforms and some use cases. Um, again, 
supposed to be interactive. Choose how you want to interrupt, right? Hands up is fine, waving is fine. Please don't throw things at me. Okay, so this is a product management slide. You can tell because it's really pretty. My slides are pretty basic. Um, so standards compliance. So the ports we're selling today are standard to 1000 base T and 10G base T. Um, the standards project for 802.3BZ is in progress. I'll tell you a bit more about the status of that later on. So we're supporting PUE, PUE Plus, and UPUE. So 15, 30, and 60 watts. So we're supporting that on both 1000 base T and 2.5 and 5, and, and also on 10G base T. So our goal, again, is to give you the same infrastructure. You're used to delivering both data and power. We want to keep, let you do that. I talked a lot about this, right? We're really trying to basically protect your infrastructure investment. Right? Anything which says, I've got this great new idea, but I'm going to pull out all the cabling, that becomes a job for lots of money, lots of different people. It's a very long project. If you can just part of your normal refresh cycle, refresh your switches, then having end devices come in, that's a much easier incremental upgrade. Um, and we also want to maintain the reach. A core part of doing this was to support the APs coming. And we had the argument earlier, the discussion earlier on, is this today or tomorrow or the next day? But it's going to be there. So I want to make sure that you can basically pop out an old AP, plug in a new one and not have to touch the cabling. Make sense? Okay. Products. So this is the same three products. So we actually, these were all announced at Cisco Live in Milan last year. They all started shipping middle of, middle of 15. So if you go to Auto Solutions, you'll find all this. So we have line cards for the 4500E, um, line cards for, so switches for the 3850s, and we also have a compact switch over here. Uh, enterprise people. What sort of switches do you have? 2K, 3K, 4K? Don't care? Some of everything? Yeah. 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 So what I tend to find is people, it depends on where you are and what your building is. So the 4K is cheaper for some things, 3K is for other. I like the compacts, the compacts are a whole lot of fun. Um, they solve some certain use cases, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, do you suspect at the beginning with the NIC uh, cards any interoperability problems? Can you hold that thought? Because I've got some slides on that later on. Okay. If I don't cover mm -hmm. it, pull me up. So, very cool news for me. Um, last week, uh, Cisco announced or made public the fact we have an AP3800. Um, there's lots of wireless detail in here, but I'm not a wireless guy, I'm not going to get into it. From my point of view, here is the basic thing. Um, we're claiming combined data rate of 5.2 gig, and it's supporting uh, multi-gig Ethernet, 2.5 and 5G ST. So, for me, this is sort of the culmination of what I told TFDX last year was we're going to have this, and now I can actually say we have it. So you should be able to go see this in the world of solutions if you're interested. Um, I have a photo of one somewhere. So, the gory details on the APs, Please go and ask a wireless person, right? Not my thing. <laughs> but from our point of view, we're now saying this is now available. So ideally, it would have all come out at the same time. But in reality, I think the refresh cycle is not the same. So I don't really see a problem because I'm going to tell you, here's what's coming. It's up to you to plan your refresh cycle. I don't know what it's going to be. OK. So let's talk use cases. At this stage, I would hope to get some feedback. Um, so the AP one is pretty clear, right? I want to evolve my APs. I want to keep going forward. So what else could I think about doing? So if I was looking from campuses, you know, sorry, campus servers, manufacturing floor is one of them, right? Someone who's doing a lot of transfers of model data. So let's say you have a, um, a CNC machine. If you want to dump stuff down to it in a hurry, right? That could be just as much data as I can get. Um, enterprise workspace. I think if you look around your workspace, depending on where you are, there's a set of people who would really like more bandwidth. So let's say they actually have it there, it's a local, um, Content editing is one of them. Maybe they're doing CAD CAM, big database, for some reason. If they come to you right now and say, geez, I'd really love to get 10 UST, and you look at them and you say, I understand, but I'm really sorry. Now you say, hang on a second. For incremental investment, I could satisfy those guys' needs. So it's not that this is a way called technology, but this lets you solve problems for your users, particularly the high-end users, for whom today you have to say, I'm sorry. Um, content editing, I covered CAD CAM. So we had conversations with some manufacturers, and they were like, hang on a second, if I could do this, then I could transfer these designs from this guy's workstation to the other one. Um, you also see it uh, high-end high -end workstations, like, sorry, high-end universities. So let's say you're doing um, astrophysics. You've got lots of data. Material science. All those people today, most of them are in old buildings. Again, they may have asbestos, pulling your cable is a problem. You don't want to pull it for a couple of guys. So again, if I can give you incremental investment to solve their problem, you can let them do their work. Does that make sense? Questions? Um, 
Let's just consider another case, right? So this is a case that we're actually talking about right now. Let's imagine you have a 3850, which by the way is the switch I worked on. I'm the architect of that switch, and I love it dearly. But somewhere like a, like a Walmart or a big store, what they might have is in their store core, they'll have a stack of switches. Out in the, edge, in the corner of each store, or maybe in the cash register, they'll have a compact switch. So today, that would be running 100 meg down on one gig up. So maybe what I do is I basically turn this thing around, I'm going to run this at two and a half and five, and I'll run one gig down here. So depending on how you want to play over subscriptions, I basically have eight gig down here. So instead of running, you know, four to one oversubscribed, I could basically run eight into five or eight into ten. So this is giving you some more ways to play with speed upgrades on the current infrastructure, right? No redesign, just goes faster. So that makes it a very easy story to sell and understand. Peter, you have that stepwise technology within the 3850, right? Yes. I, I, I can talk about stackwise until you bleed if you'd like. Okay. Was, was there a particular question? Um, so, 3850 stack at... Um, 320. Eng, engineering, engineering number is 240, uh, marketing number is 480. Um, but the, so these guys, yeah, they stack fast, right? Yeah. So 3750 to 3850 was a fundamental redesign of the basic structure. <laughs> so it's running pretty fast. So, I, love, I love the 3850 as well. Um, it's my favorite switch. It's, it's an amazing switch. Um, a lot of customers might find it to be maybe a little expensive. Is there any plans to put in gig into 29? Do I look like product management? <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me be more serious for a second. So the way I think about it, I was talking to someone earlier. You can imagine in the car world, you have like Formula One cars and Ferraris and Lexus and Camrys and Corollas, right? I build cameras and crawlers. Right now, this is sort of your camera model. So we will get there, but it really depends on how much volume we get because right now the price point for 3650 doesn't let you put this stuff in. We'll think about it, right? So what will be really nice to have is, and you can find me later on, tell me how it would make sense. Because I talk to product management a lot and you should go talk to them um, because I believe you. But equally, we do get into the problem of even though I believe that this has such an advantage that the cost of the port's not very relevant, people still ask you the cost. So the numbers I've seen is pulling a new cable is three to three to five to seven hundred dollars. If you have to do that, then the cost of the switch is small. So it's gonna get there. How fast it gets there depends on customer need and how fast we can drive volume. Right? Because in general I cannot reduce pricing until I get volume up. So I've got to get this thing going. So my personal goal is to eventually move everyone who buys a gig to two and a half. Right, because we just need to keep moving people up the line. One, one last question on that. So if you, you do, promise if it's you, the last one? Um, no. <laughs> okay. if, you do, if you do end up buying, or if you have bought a 3850, is, is, is the feature baked in, or do you need licensing? I mean, um, can, you, can you just turn this is, on? This is new hardware. So if you bought, the, but if you've bought a 3850. If you bought a 3850. You, is, there a, is there an additional license? There, there is an explicit SKU that costs more money. Okay, right. okay. So basically a large part of this is in, is in the, um, the 10 g T5 that's on the ports. Okay. Right? And so it is fundamentally new silicon. Yeah. But what you can do is the 3850 stackable. So let's say you, have a, you currently have a stack of two, you can buy one more and put it in there. Gotcha. Okay. And but, uh, was modular, is there a kind of an SFP plus version for that? There is not an SFP plus yet. Um, right now, as far as I'm aware, no one is actually selling a 10G SFP plus because of heat. I expect there will be some, but on the modular side of the house, we have a line card that does this. Uh, so you could uh, make that, but it's not there at the moment, yeah? Um, I think we're going to need a couple of generations of evolution of the technology until it's small enough. The problem with an SFP plus cage is, you, is they're not very good at dissipating heat. Yeah. So um, I've heard of people thinking about this. I don't think it's on the market yet. Okay. Right. Um, so, but for the 4K module, we'll just show you a line card that has um, basically ports on it. Yeah, so, okay. In, I mean, in general, the copper SFPs, they come along a little while later because they're an incremental story. Um, again, get back to me is like what, get back to me is what you think you want because I know some people are interested and I can pass the information on to them. I mean, for all these things, it's always, I could build this, but who will buy it and why? So one of the things I'd like back from all of you guys is, I mean, firstly, did I make sense? But secondly, I could use this for this reason, because I have a, a bunch of hats, right? I should have said up front, I'm Cisco uh, principal engineer, but I'm also the Embassy Alliance chair. One of the things we're trying to do is tell a story to the people about use cases that make sense. So I'd dearly love from all of you guys, hey, 
I would use this for and here's what would make sense. So. Yeah, for this model, if you have something in place that is already supporting SFP mm. Plus, you could converge to 5 gig uh, sure. with that module, so you need also to change the core level sure. to get uh, the access. So, yeah. so, so for the bulk of our customers, we, we, we're using PUE, right? PUE and copper, right? So the, the using the copper SFP, I think is a small subset of enterprise that exists other places, but drop me a note and say, this will make sense because, and I'll pass it on to whoever I can find. So you don't have any problem running the um, older 3850s with the newer ones in a stack? It's no. going to be fine? No. Of course that works. Okay. Otherwise, we'd look silly. I try not to, I try not to look silly. Okay, so, so cases we thought, talked about doing this. I talked about retail stores. You also see it on things like a guest cabin. Maybe you're in a, um, you're out somewhere in, in the wilderness. Uh, so it's like cabins in a uh, resort. Uh, cruise ships is sort of interesting. Conference rooms is interesting. Retail stores. So I really like the compacts. You should go and have a look at them. They tend to be fanless, they're small. They, they solve some really nice problems. Okay, let me get going. Other things to talk about. So uh, network attached storage, right? I've seen demo, demo NICs for Embase T to go in a small uh, network attached storage. That's sort of nice if you're building a content editing story. Um, someone, anyone of you have a Mac? Yes? Uh, so you have Thunderbolt, right? So if someone had, for instance, a Thunderbolt to two and a half or five gig adapter, and they could plug that into a small desktop NAS that did the same thing, that would sort of be cool. So I've seen that at Introp, and they'll probably be back there again next year. Um, service provider gateways. So today, right, um, you can get more than, more than a gig down from SP Gateway, either by um, Metro Internet or by a plum. So watch, watch your hand off to the house, right? 10 g base T is too expensive. Um, small cell. Small cell guys would really like more than a gig. They don't have the structure. They're doing basically right antenna and local processing. They want two, four to five gig. So it's interesting for them. A security cameras, uh, signage, medical devices. If you were here last year in Milan, we talked to a customer from, uh, he was in a panel. You see the line, I think it's a Belgian hospital. So they were, they'd started four years ago to transition from 6A to, from category six to 6A. They'd done 25% of the buildings. So they're also transitioning towards digital medicine. So they have lots of x-ray machines, they have lots of scans. So again, they want high bandwidth on the edge of the network. Um, content editing I mentioned, um, desktop or gaming PCs. So Asus has already um, announced a, uh, a NIC for their Republic of Gamers series. Um, there does seem to be a little disagreement sometimes. Some people think gamers only care about low latency. But when I was talking to my colleague from Australia who runs a LAN gaming thing, he said, no, no, we, all we should care about is no drops. And so there'll be a market there. Um, again, it's a high-end market, but I need to get volume going. I think there'll probably be interest for people still buy desktop PCs. So the cost of the one gig port and desktop PC, PC is almost nothing. Um, my colleague from Intel tells me those computers can actually push a lot more data. So I would hope to see them coming out with two and a half and five gig interfaces. So as I said before, there's a whole lot of use cases for which more than a gig just makes sense. We're not there for everyone yet, but if I can get this going, then I can bring down the price. Make sense? Following along, yeah. nodding, excellent. So I started putting this together a while ago because I was trying to list all the people who do stuff in Ethernet. And it's getting surprisingly bigger. I actually need to make this about five slides or maybe 10. Um, and when I actually put this in, I was thinking it's like, it's like a village because you start off and you, you meet someone on the outside and as you get deeper, you find all these other people who do things. So clearly, um, IEEE 82.3, the Ethernet Working Group, they basically own the standards for Ethernet. So they are the SDO, they're the standards definition organization. Um, the Ethernet Alliance, I showed you the, um, the poster earlier. Um, they, found, they evolved out of one of the, um, I think it was the 10G Vendor Alliance. And their job really is to advocate for Ethernet, right? They evangelize it, they represent customers. Basically, they're the, sort of, they're the marketing arm of, the, of top three. The IETF, um, clearly the IETF does a lot of stuff. The IETF does not, not touch physical layer. We get a little interesting in here, right? The OIF. So the OIF is sort of interesting. They do a lot of the fundamental work about making sure optics works with each other. Now, stuff we don't tend to think about, but unless that happens, right, we don't see product. So OIF defines optics. They define chip-to-chip um, -chip inter interfaces. So Ethernet often doesn't do that. They, they inherit from other people. So you might go and see the people at Ethernet, but they're off next week to go into OIF. So many people in the standards group that we wear multiple hats, depending on which organization you are, you sort of talk different things. Um, these two I'm getting to know more better, right? TIA, TIA, TR42, 
an ISO IEC JTC SG, SC25 working group three. So <laughs> these are the cabling bodies. Great name. So in general, in Ethernet, we say we need a cable of this type. So these are the guys who tell you how to build that cable. So TI, TIA, TR42, they write the specs for North America and some of the world. And they're basically how to build structured cabling. So those are the guys who write the recommendations of if you want to do this, here's how you lay it out, here's the connectors, here's the bundling rules. That's what these guys do for a living. Um, ISO IEC is the European equivalent for that. And so we have to deal with all these people. For instance, the DOT3 standards will refer off to the TIA or ISO IEC standards. And so you find, like I go visit Ethernet and then I meet people there who then go off to ISO IEC. Um, InBase Alliance. This is the alliance, I'm a, so I'm a, this is a vendor alliance. We're pushing two and a half and five GBSC as a technology. We're not a standards definition organization, but we have a specification. But our mission in life is really to get this technology up and going and so everyone can deploy it. So we don't officially work with uh, Additive 3 because we have no standing. But this is where we move things on ahead out of the uh, standards group. Um, system vendors, like we build product. But ultimately it's all about you guys, right? The question is, you don't buy our stuff just for the hell of it, you buy it to solve a problem. So all these people here, they're all working to try and make you solve your problem. And one of my fundamental tasks is to represent you to them. So if there's something you don't like and you don't tell us about it, we can't solve your problem. And so what's often the case, we end up arguing inside the standards group, like what will a customer need? So one of the things I'd like to do more of is hear back from people like you, tell us what's going on, what you think about it, right? So don't just be annoyed at these groups because they don't listen, speak. So in this group, right, Later on, you guys are going to give me feedback. Here's what was interesting, here's what didn't make sense. Because I want to make it more transparent about who's doing what so we can all interact better. Right? I can't solve your problem if I don't understand it. Yes? OK. So I'm going to do previous material that Peter has seen before. Um, if we think about how we deploy a wireless today, right, clearly access switches, mostly 1,000 base T ports. It's a power of Ethernet, power source equipment, right? 15, 30, or um, 60 watts. By the way, the current standard that's running, Adafilt 3BT, they're currently looking at doing 100 watts. That's sort of where they're heading, 90 to 100 watts is. And part of the reason they're doing that is they never want to come back and write another one. So we've been doing this for a while. We keep having to say, let's do 15, let's do 30. So they're really trying to do 90. That's, they think that's really the end of the technology. But that gets pretty interesting because um, this is a 90 watt adapter. If I got 90 watts out of my POE, I wouldn't need to carry one of them. And so that's starting to get the, you could change, you could run very different things on 90 watts. So clearly there's a bunch of people talking about these things up here, the lighting. If you're running an LED lighting, you need 50 to 70 watts. Let me quickly run through this. So where we are today, we're dominated by Cat6. This is about 53% of the installed base. Um, that's as of 2014. Here is uh, Cat5e. So 90% of the world's base cable is um, 5e and 6. What's interesting is we're dominated by thousand uh, gigabit, right? So we're in about here. The world is mostly gigabit. Uh, more than 4 billion, uh, 10, 100 meg and gigabit in the last 20 years. Install cable plan over time, I'm not going to run through this. What you're finding is this is 6A, 6A is growing fast, but here's your, here's your install base. Uh, install base estimate, 1.4 billion, 1.3 billion of them are 5 in 6. So that is the install base I'm working with. Uh, I'm going to skip through this pretty fast. This is just a picture of how radio bandwidth is evolving. This is pulled from a Cisco white paper. Um, PDF slides for this will come out later on. In fact, right at the end of this. Um, the 11 is outgrowing 1,000 base T. Uh, AP is going to upgrade it faster than switches, which is faster than cabling. Um, dot 11 AX is coming. They're targeting 4X of throughput per station. Dot 11. So this is updated from 2016. Here's the transition from 11N to 11AC. They're guessing by 2020, it's all 11 AC. Here's the guesstimate for transition from wave one to wave two. So this is the current predictions from Deloro. Basically they're saying, we'll start ramping um, wave two around about 2016. So remember wave two is offering you anywhere, depending on your belief system, from a gig to three or four. Ethernet, we're clearly seeing about 2015 we crossed over, more people connecting via Wi-Fi than Ethernet. And here's, here's our current predictions, right? We believe, and this is Deloro numbers, um, that this is the growth for five and two and a half. So by 2020, we're thinking it's about 25% of the market. So that's where we want to go. 
if I can get this off, I can start driving volume, I can start reducing prices, it's going to be easy to adopt. So first I need to find the people who have to have it, and I can get them going. Okay, technology, we're going to skip through really fast because I'm at the 15 minute. Um, so this is how we build cabling. Switch, stranded, patch, solid. You've got to remember, right, the stranded cable is easy stuff to bend. That's not so good for long distance, right, channel matters. Um, what you're going to find in Data 3, if you ever look, is Data Find Link Segment. And link segment is everything between here and here. So it carries in the whole thing. So when I talk about what I have to get down, I have to consider the cables, the, connected, the connectors in the box, and all the patch panels. That's my link segment, right? They call it link segment instead of channel. I think it was channel. Um, going to quickly go through here. So we're talking earlier about when you bundle. It's a little weird because it's around. So this guy in the middle is the one we worry about, but all around him. He's got uh, aggressor cables. So we talked earlier, when you bundle, you get noise from everyone else. So the real problem is, so this is my, uh, this is my four pairs. As we saw earlier, you get the structure to hold them in. So I get noise from each other. I also get noise from all these guys around the outside. So this is where it gets difficult, because you think it's a nice cable, but it's actually really noisy. Um, so when I think about it, 100 meters of something is actually a channel number. When I did the survey in Cisco Light in San Diego, I think the longest I got was someone running um, 1,000 base C over Cat5e at 700 feet. Sometimes it won't work over 40. So the 100 meter number is like one of those magic numbers, it's like 50 milliseconds, right? What it actually is, is you basically get back to the channel. And so depending on your cabling, depending on where your lights are, your mileage will vary. That's true today, it's true tomorrow. Um, some key points I'm gonna note here. So this is basically 1,000 base C sits down here. Basically, an eye question here about 62 and a half meg megahertz, right? So you're nicely inside the 100, the 100 megahertz of 5e. Then you may see you need about 400, right? Which is nicely inside the 500 megahertz of 6a. What we're fundamentally doing as part of the sand is we're going to slide 2.5 gig down inside the Cat 5e spec, and we're going to slide 5 gig in about here. So then you say, hang on, hey, you told me you can get it over 5e. I'm going to say, yeah, we can. There's lots of interesting work in terms of how we actually do our signal correction. There's boatloads of DSPs in these files because what they're actually doing is they're getting stuff over a really noisy link. When you look at it closely, it sort of feels like Wi-Fi. Um, I'm going to skip through this pretty fast. I um, guess the key point in here is we start off seeing something like this. Right? This is the noise that the fire she sees. Cancel some echo. You basically you cancel for the near, near end crosstalk. You cancel for the far end crosstalk. You move into simple interference. You get a nice clean signal. So the base T fires are doing a boatload of of the DSP just to get the signal out. Yes, a boatload is actually a formal definition. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over. This is, this is a detailed slide I put together. We'll talk later on. If you really care about cutting schemes, I can find the guy to talk to. Okay, where are we? Okay, the Alliance, about 40 plus companies. You can see them all here. Big promoters, um, most of the major fire companies. Our job is basically to try and get people to adopt, right? So we all want to make money, we want to explain it to you, so you go out and buy it. Um, the Alliance roles evolved a little bit. Last year we were looking to build consensus because there was a possibility of a standards argument. All those who remember VHS versus beta. Yeah. Do you remember .11 end? Do you remember how long it locked out for? Okay, we wanted to avoid that. So last year we were building consensus. We're done. That bit is over. So this year we want to basically do deployment. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, white papers and key facts here at this link. Uh, news releases and blogs will be that link. All this stuff will come out later on. You don't have to write it down. If you really want to care, just go look at mbase.t.org and you'll find it. Um, Products-wise, um, switches, the first products we're shipping mid-2015. Um, I am here speaking at Cisco, so I'm not going to speak about our competitors in general. Um, access points, we've announced. right? So you can go and see them on the floor of uh, World of Solutions, AP3800. Uh, PCs and servers, the Ethernet controller shipping from Intel is the X550. Those of you who follow me on Twitter will have seen that I tweeted about it. Um, there's a NIC card announced from Asus, there's more to come. Uh, I think the Asus NIC card is shipping early 2016, but go look at Asus. Just stick to my question before. Is it uh, tested that this uh, NIC card will be working uh, with a um, chip in the switch? Well, so I will point out to you that Intel is on a promoter board. Intel are, provide, Intel are providing the X550 controller. Um, the, uh, so basically right now, everyone who's selling stuff is coming out of this roster of companies. So everybody in the Enbase team alliance make interoperability tests? And you can be sure 
if he's on this list, it will work together, yeah? So that is our goal, right? So we have already run one plug fest, it all passed, right? As time goes forward, what you're gonna find is that people in this alliance are selling downstream, and we are working on dealing with compliance so we can deal with all the downstream vendors, right? Right, right now, you're buying from the major vendors, we're all fine. As it evolves, you'll be more in a normal Ethernet alliance. But hold that thought, I have some more of it coming. Um, okay, products, uh, product listings. So we have a listing on the side of member products. So this is just member companies saying, I've got this, we're listing them, pointing it back to the member company. Go have a look at that later on. Um, analysts, so this is from Deloro. They're basically saying it's a new market, right? If you can basically put new stuff over the current cabling, you have a new market that, that exists. Um, this is from Matthias at IHS. Again, great story. Reuse the cable and get more bandwidth. Um, this one's pretty interesting. This one is from Bob Wheeler, a uh, press story we had. He's basically saying NBASE D is one. Okay. Wrote to a standard. We started in November 2014. We did what was called Call for Interest, which I led. In March, we agreed to form a task force and get going. In May, we adopted our technical baselines, which means we solved the arguments. Uh, between, now, between then and January, we reviewed it. So we started working group ballot. So we're done, we think we're technically complete. We, we, we believe our standard is done in September. Uh, this is the way IEEE shows it. It's sort of interesting because it matters when this is. You can only get a standard approved when the standard boards meet. So we showed this. So we started over here. Um, we adopted through. So we got through, baselines are here. We're up here, all right. So we're gonna start working group ballot. We expect to finish pretty soon, then we go to sponsor ballot. If this goes as planned, that's less than two years from the start to the finish. So we're going pretty fast. So we were at Introp last year. Going to be at Introp this year? Okay, we'll be back again. So last year, this was our demo. All the people could get together. We had a nice booth. You came past and visited, right, Tom? Did you come past and visit last year? Okay, we'll be back this year. It'll be bigger and better. Um, Cisco Live, we had, Cisco, we had Intel down in our booth. So this gentleman down here is the uh, Intel product manager for this networking silicon. They also had, uh, they had an open server with their NIC running inside it. Pre-production NIC from Intel. So, running very nicely. So we're working well with Intel to try and make all this work together. We had a plug fest in September 15. Standard normal plug fest, people bring their pre-release gear, you try and get it together. Everyone did their tests, everyone worked. And there's a great fundamentals uh, link. If you guys have seen TechWise TV, yes? He's got a four or five minute video. I've been tweeting about it, it's really worth seeing. Very easy to understand. Let me wrap up. So we've come a long way from the original roots. We're continuing to evolve, basically. We, we think we're gonna grow here to enough. So we're, we're responding to this need. This is the wireless need. You know, as I said before, we're looking at 9% install base to 5 and 6. So and we believe this room. When is the official standard approved? It's draft right now. It's draft right now. We're currently guesstimate, we're, we're estimating September this year. Um, so Ethernet is the foundation for everything, and it supports all the Wi-Fi guys. Um, and I'm done. I, I have more things to talk about, but that'll have to be another time. I've got a question, Peter. So just one. It may you just one. It may have been on that slide there, and I just couldn't read it. But so a, a big portion of what this is meant to accomplish is to delay replacing physical cabling infrastructure, right? How I would have said it differently. It's, it's to let you replace it at your own need. Sure, sure. Right. So my question is... And so I also have to say, so I have, cable, I have cabling partners in my group, right? And so it took them a while to get across this, but now they're seeing a very clear thing because now they have a very clear message of what to sell, right? Because if you didn't do this, right, we'd just be stuck at gig for another five to 10 years. So yes, it gives the option to get value out of your existing cabling infrastructure. Right. Uh, so. I was thinking, especially during the one where you were showing the wireless needs, and I think maybe that's that chart up there in the corner. Uh, you know, how much longer do we have before we're going to run into the same problem? You know so that's that's an interesting question. Um, so some people believe that in a real world environment, you don't get much above a gig anytime. Right? I've I've seen that conversation. Um, I don't believe it long term. Um, the my guess is you get five to 10 years. Um, so if I was doing a building now, time. I would be putting in 6A. So 
I think of, I think of wiring in a building as you're really 15 to 20 years because you don't ever want to go back. So I think what you do now is you say, we had a problem because there was nothing apparently beyond a gig and you didn't need 10. So everyone has been stuck for a long time. So my answer would be, if you're going to go and do cabling, pull it, put 6.8 in there now because you don't want to go back for 20 years. So um, it's possible we might come back later on and try and fit 10 GBST down this, but it's going to be really hard, it'll be expensive. So, this should be seen as, we just sort of got stuck for a while because there was no end device that needed more than a gig. Now that showed up, we should move on. Fair enough. Did I answer the question? Yep. Yeah, it does, thank you. Okay, so I have more stuff to talk about, but I'm out of time. So, last questions, around the room. You good? No one fell asleep, I'm doing well. <laughs> <coughs> one quick one. Yeah. Is we talked before about building a business case for this. Do, is, do you make it easy for people to build a business case internally to, to do this? I mean, do you price up cabling or typical cabling costs? Stuff that makes it easy for an engineer to sell this if they wanted to go with it. So, they, um, so that's a thing which I would like my alliance to do more work on. Yeah. Okay. And so what would be helpful for me, because I can go and tell people to do this work, yeah. but a clear description of, like, I got the picture. To make this easy for me, here's what would help. Because yeah, okay. I would like to get the people to create collateral for that. Sure. Now I know, I know that, so we have cabling people in, but right now they don't know that this need exists. Okay. So in reasonable detail, right, tell me what would make it easy for you and I'll try and find someone to get it done. Okay. I missed the part, are there already UCS servers from Cisco available with five gig? There are not. There are not. Um, okay. What I would like to hear back from you, because I, sh I have a personal opinions on this, if that existed, how would that make sense, right? And the reason I'm being a little careful is that the data center story today is go 10 and go 25 and go 50, right? And people go, why the hell would you need like two and a half? Yeah, if you, if you think big data centers, that is yeah. true. If you think small offices, you have only one server that is all, uh, serving a small office, yeah? So I don't want to... So I absolutely believe you. Yeah. See previous comment. What would be really nice is back from you, I heard this and I would like this because this would help, right? Okay. Because if you can write that for me, I can find someone to listen to it. Because when I go and say it to people, it's like, what did he know, it's just an engineer. But if you say, hey, here's what it would look like, right, that gives real meat to the use case. Okay. Um, so that's the true in general, right, guys? If you think this is interesting, think about where it would make sense to you and give us back to, here's what I saw, here's what was interesting, here's what would help me. I'm super interested in the compatibility between the Cisco and, and other devices in the end, because like you mentioned, the camera surveillance, right? I've got sites that have just, you know, one or two cameras, right? But they're not always coming back a another Cisco switch wired connection back. So I'm, so, I'm interested in so, seeing... So think about it this way for a second, right? Ethernet's pretty good because mostly everyone who does Ethernet does their job properly and they all work together. Mm -hmm. Basically, everyone who's building a fire today, the major vendors, is in my lines. And all, everyone's goal is to make a, a software upgrade from InBase T to the standard. So, if we didn't have compatibility, we'd have no story. Super interesting. So, if we, don't, if we have no interoperability, we're dead in the water, right? You're not going to buy. And so, if we can't give you that, if we can't give you that comfort, then standards risk is going to stop you buying. 